2 Peter chapter 1. Look at it with me. Very familiar to many of you. We'll turn to a couple other places. <clears throat> you all right with this? Brother Tom's the one that clipped it on me. He did. He moved it where he wanted it. So I'm, I'm going to blame you if it goes bad. Verse 12. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, I think it proper, I think it important. As long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Can we pray together? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all you do, you've done for us in this meeting. Lord, I don't just say that lightly. Much prayer, fasting, effort has gone into it. And Lord, you have just miraculously, wonderfully worked. And our hearts have been touched and stirred. And I pray that you would help me not to ruin it, as the preacher said. Help me to be a vessel that you can work through for just a few minutes. Lord, it might help somebody as we get ready, as I said, and go back to our own places of service. I pray that you'd use me. And we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. we see from verse 14 that these are really some of Peter's last words. He said there in verse 14, knowing that shortly I must put off this, my tabernacle. It's been revealed to him by the Lord Jesus that his time on earth is very short. And so oftentimes, typically when someone is giving last words, they carry some special meaning. And uh, many of you have heard, or at least maybe some of you sadly have perhaps been involved in the calling of the family around a bed of someone who is nearing the end and still has their mind and they want to say something to the family. Those last words are typically uh, carry a special meaning. Now, it's not really, not really that much in the South, all right? I live in the South. Not really, in the South, famous last words are a little different. There are things like this. Hey, boys, watch this. And that's it. That's it. He's dead. <laughs> So you don't really get a chance, you know, what's this button do? That was his last word. In the last couple years, there's been some new ones have come around and it's like this. Of course, I know how to do it. I watched YouTube. He's no longer with us, but uh, most of the time, last words carry some kind of special meaning. I find it interesting that Peter, having an opportunity to write some of his final words, uh, was not trying to. He decided not to try and impress them with some new thought. He didn't want to share some brand new revelation. Instead, uh, he said that he, he said, "I think it meet. I think it's fitting, proper, important that as long as I'm in this tabernacle, what little time I have left in my body, what little time I have left on this earth, I think it's important that I stir you up by putting you in remembrance. That's what I'm going to do by way of introduction. I, I want to." Uh, just put you in remembrance of really of some of the things we've heard in these messages. And then I want to give you a simple thought to take with you. Have you ever been to a dinner, maybe a family dinner or a church potluck type dinner, and it was just magnificent? I mean, food everywhere. And, and uh, I'm not talking about, you know, just eating a lunch, but I mean where it's just so much and you eat and then you see some more and you eat and you just keep eating. They just keep bringing it and you just keep eating it until finally, finally, you literally think, I don't believe I could take one more bite. Now, I know y'all are not going to confess to that gluttony, so I'm not going to have you raise your hand. Uh, but I would say some of you have eaten like that. And then all this, I mean, you feel like you might die if you ate one more bite. And then somebody brings out dessert. <laughs> and something miraculous happens in your body. <laughs> and, and you think, I could probably handle one more bite or a piece of that, or a piece of that, and you start, you start putting some of that dessert in on top of all that other. And I believe, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm not making light of this, I believe that's what I'm supposed to do tonight. I believe that you have heard, listen, now listen, everybody's got their part, and sometimes I wonder, Lord, what is my part? And uh, the, the, the preaching that you've been hearing this week, and I'm not just saying this, some of them are not even here. I'm not saying this to, you know, uh, puff up or kiss up or anything like that. I'm saying it has been unbelievable. We're talking about the meat of the word that we've been hearing. The depth has been magnificent. The, the you know, exegesis of the scriptures have been, y'all didn't think I knew that word, did you? <laughs> I saw some of y'all right there. I read every now and then. And uh, it's been unbelievable. It's been the meat of the word. And so I feel like there are times in this meeting this week, I'm like, you're going to have to slow down. I don't, I've about had, I don't know if I can take much more. How many of you feel like that sometimes? We come to get refreshed. 
And I was talking to one fellow, and both of us said, we're resigning when we go home. <laughs> we, we discovered that our, our church don't meet, need me to be a better pastor. They need a better pastor. That's what I discerned. <laughs> And you're just taking it. You're thinking, oh my goodness. And you're still, I mean, for me, I, I get stuck and start processing something that the Lord really pointed out. And they're moving on, giving more stuff that I know is also good. And I'm missing that because I'm stuck right here where the Lord's got me. And it just feels like that. And I don't know that tonight we need any more of that. And you're lucky you're not going to get none. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Dessert is often fluff. And I don't want to be that guy. To be honest with you, I feel like sometimes I think, Lord, why don't you why don't you let me preach something that'll show these people that I have a Bible and that I, that I read it sometimes. <laughs> but tonight, I'm just, you know what I am? Whipped cream. That's it. <laughs> it's basically nothing. Whipped cream's basically nothing. That's it. That's what you got tonight. And if you don't like whipped cream, you might as well go to sleep. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I want to try to stir you up by putting in remembrance of a couple of things and Maybe give us one thought at the end. You know, just in the, just in the preaching in here, we have had such a challenge, haven't we? We've been challenged about our Christian life and our ministry. It started with a challenge. I call it a challenge on priority with Pastor Clark in that first service where he basically said the most important thing for all of us is that we be a man, we can say a woman of God, man of God, woman of God. That he said we need to be, you know what it is? Ultimately, he said, you need to be real. So what do you mean real? I mean a real Christian. Not just when people are looking, not just when you have the pulpit, but real all the time. And that's the, that was the challenge we got that night, that we would live in such a way, he said, that every city deserves to have a man of God. Man, I was challenged by that. I have young, as one of the ways you know you are getting older and you're not still just that little boy in that little church is that younger people start coming up and asking you advice. And sometimes young preachers will come up and say, if you could give me one piece of advice. And to be honest with you, I didn't have any idea what to tell them. I didn't know what to tell them. As I've gotten a little older, here's what I tell them. I say, I'll tell you this, you be real. That's what I tell them. You be a real Christian. Don't you be one thing here and then something else out there. You be a real Christian. And that's what Pastor Clark started with. And boy, I started thinking, hey, in my house, I want my family to know that there's a real Christian living in that house. I want my kids to know that I don't like to use the term man of God describing myself. I think that's kind of something people should say about you, but you shouldn't say about yourself. But that's the title he was using. And I want, listen, if anybody believes there's a real man of God in our town, I want it to start in my house. I want our church to believe that God sent a man to them that's real. And I want our town to know that there's a man of God that's there sent from heaven to love them and their families. That was the stuff. Hey, that's why we started the meeting. That was the challenge right off the bat. We could have left right then. And you ought to want to have it in your heart to be real. A real Christian. I believe in that armor of God text where it talks about your loins girt about with truth. I believe that truth there is not, not really a reference to the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit. I believe that's a reference to a sincere Christian life, a reference to being real. They talk about how that that belt is what holds all the rest together. And you need to understand that that's what does hold it all together. Your real walk with God, your real time with God, you being real with God when nobody's looking, that's what holds all the rest of it together. Hey, if we want to be safe in these last days from all the fiery darts and everything else, it has to start with being a real man of God or woman of God. That was the challenge on priority. We've been challenged about the problems throughout the week, haven't we? Dr. Gibbs dealt very plainly with our sin problems. Brother Charlie said he got to like number three and thought, you can go ahead and quit. I was thinking, number one, you can go ahead and quit. <laughs> Amen. The bad thing about listening to Brother Gibbs is he makes you vote on everything while he's doing it. <laughs> How many of you know that you're a sinner? <laughs> and if you've been around him very long, you know that in a little bit, he's really going to stick it to you and everything you just voted on is going to just throw you in it. <laughs> and there he goes, number one. And it's always so plain, isn't it? It's not, I, I'm a very simple guy. I keep just giving y'all astounding truths about myself. I know, I'm a very simple guy. Can you believe it? And uh, sometimes you hear preachers preach something and you love it and you want it. 
but you ain't, you're not exactly sure how to do what they said. I'm not trying to be funny. Like, you need to know God. You need to know God. And I've done it myself, but not tell them then how to know God. But you know, when Brother Gibbs preaches, it's always something so simple and down to earth. You can't leave saying, well, I didn't really know what he meant. I remember one time he was preaching about preferring others. Preferring others. We're supposed to prefer others. And he started talking about traffic. Y'all ever heard him do that? He said a little bit about it the other night. And he started saying that preferring others, you know, is like when, when you're waiting in traffic and then people are trying to get in. And he said, and if you're not letting people in, you're not preferring others. I thought, that is not what that means. <laughs> <laughs> I've read that verse many times. God never said that to me. <laughs> God always says to me, you're the reason we're all sitting here. That's what, <laughs> come on. You know, them ones that come flying up by everybody and you just want to, you just want to pray and thank God for them. <laughs> Brother Gibbs started dealing with our, you know what he was dealing with? Our sin problems. And if you're like me, it was right there. It was right there. Second, I mean, it's just first two messages. Brother Loney dealt with our situational problems. He talked about your day. Can I just say something to a few of you that got real help that night? Don't forget it. You're going to leave, and you, you've heard so many messages since Brother Loney's message. If you're not careful, you're going to go back to where you're from, and that day is still going there. And you're going to get right back into the shape you were in before because you forgot what God said to you in that message. Don't forget what he said. I want to stir you by putting you in remembrance. Do you remember that night? Do you remember some of you coming to the altar when he preached? How that God spoke to you. Hey, remember that. Amen. Take that with you. Amen. We've heard about our problems. Dr. Gibbs dealt plainly with our sin problem. Brother Loney dealt with our situational problems. Brother Kenny dealt with our satanic problems. He said, with the help of the Lord, we can shake it off even when the serpent puts venom in our bodies. We can shake it off. Thank God. for. Aren't you glad that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world? Amen. And then tonight, Brother Dean dealt with our societal problems. And he said that we can rest. Thank God. Aren't you glad we can rest regardless of what's going on in the society around us? We do not have to be governed by the craziness of this world. Amen. Amen. We've been challenged on priority and we've been challenged about the problems. We've been challenged about the source of power. Brother Hawkins and then Brother Pope in the session gave us a master's class on the importance and the power of prayer. And listen, if you're paying attention, I would say the Lord worked on your heart about prayer. That's where the power is. That's where the, that's where the protection is. And let me say that, listen, busyness is not a replacement for it. Just, you know, being busy, activity is not a re replacement for spirituality. And that's a trap that we often fall in. We get so busy for God that the first thing that starts getting cut out is, well, you know, Lord, you know, I got all this going on. I'm not praying as much. And all this, and we were challenged about that. And I believe that they made statements like this. They've never seen a real praying person fall into sin and mess their life up. I don't want to do that, do you? I hope you know that you could. I hope you know, I hope everybody here knows it could be me and you that could mess up next. That none of us are above messing up our time. I don't care how long you've been saved. I don't care how old you are, how long you've been in the ministry. Yes, if we don't stay up close to the shepherd, we can be the next one that falls and wrecks. But listen, but I don't think you have to. Thank God that grace is sufficient and he is still all powerful. And I'm thankful I've been challenged about prayer in this meeting, the power source. We've been challenged about our presentation. Dr. Sis exhorted us this morning about living in such a way that people can see the joy of the Lord in our lives. Remember the statement, the greatest advertisement for biblical Christianity is a joyful Christian. Amen. These people in the choir singing, probably lifting their hands and rejoicing, having a sadness and a loss in their life today. Say, so what is that? That's a picture. That's an advertisement for the grace of God in biblical Christianity. We've been challenged then about last night to remember the price for the Pope's message last night. It was honestly to me, I told my wife, I said, it's like, I mean this in the highest of compliments. It's like a dramatic presentation, right? The, he would, his voice would change depending on the person that he was quoting in the different parts of the story. And it was like watching a dramatic presentation about, listen, about what Jesus did for us. 
Listen, if you're like me, I so moved. He talked about, he, he said before he got started, Brother Pope, you talked about it was a little bit Bapticostal. Well, you was about to get a full-on dose of it if you'd have kept pushing me much farther, praise God. <laughs> I come down, listen, I come down, I just, he just kept going through it, and, and we know all of it. We, we know, well, I didn't know everything he said. I'm going to tell you, he's got, he's got one of them Bibles that got stuff in it too that mine don't have. <laughs> I mean, I know it's King James. Mine's King James, but his is better. I don't know why. <laughs> but in general, we know the story of Jesus. And he, you know what he was doing? Just what Peter said. He was stirring us up by putting us in remembrance, giving us a fresh glimpse of, listen, not just what Jesus did, but what happened for me, Brother Pope, was how you was reminding me that at every step, he did it for me. He did it for that little boy in the drunkard's home. That's who he did it for. He did it for you. He did it for that preacher's boy that would have went to hell because he thought he got saved. Oh, listen, I was challenged to remember the price that was paid so that I might even be a part of all this. We wouldn't even be here were it not for Jesus. We have been challenged to believe that he did all of this, as the old song says, because he loved me. Y'all know that one? Because he loved me, my Savior died. On the cross was crucified. Raise your hand if you know that old song I'm talking about. Let's see if we can sing that chorus. Because he loved me, my Savior died. On a cross was crucified. No greater love by mortal man has ever been known. Oh, praise God. Oh, praise his dear name, he loved me so, and now I am his. How about that? He suffered it all because he loved me. That's, that's what he was reminding us and challenging us about last night. We can get so, we can get so into doing the work of the Lord that we can forget the work of the Lord that he did. I remember reading one time, I was doing my daily reading, just, just getting through it. And I happened to read through the crucifixion. And I just, Brother Dean, I just read it. It was the next chapter, you know. And when I finished, I closed my Bible and I was ready to, you know, get about the work of the Lord. And it's like the Holy Spirit said, that didn't do nothing for you. That's what I felt like. I felt like he said, you just, you just read over that like you would have read over them leprosy verses in Leviticus. <laughs> and I just read over them. I'm just going to tell you. Except that one that says, he has lost his hair toward the front of his head and he has forehead bald, but he is clean. I like that one. <laughs> I like that one. Forehead bald. But I just felt like he said, and he was 100%, listen, he's always right, and he was so right. I just read it. To be honest with you, I didn't even really know I was reading the crucifixion. I was just reading to get through because I'm supposed to read to get through. You ever get like that? Well, see, that's what a message like that can do for you. Challenge us to remember the price that was paid. And so what I want to do tonight, I don't have a challenge for us tonight. I just want us to finish the meeting considering the privilege of it all. When we head back to our prospective homes and churches, many of us are facing some fierce or at least frustrating battles. And one of the good things about coming to a meeting like this is you can kind of separate from them. I know the texts still come and the calls still come, but you can get over here and forget it. And, and I know we're going to go back to them and they're going to be there. But just for a couple more minutes, can we take our mind off that? Can we just consider the privilege of it all? You say, well, what are you talking about? Well, Matthew chapter 7, will you turn there very quickly? I'll just give you two things, really. And Brother Charlie didn't know what I was preaching. I'd mentioned something to him on the phones. We were talking about songs, but he didn't know the, the, the message and how it was going to go, and he started having them testimonies. Brother Charlie, that, having those testimonies was perfect. Because the first thing I want to do is I just want to remind you it's a privilege to be saved. I've been saved a long time. I got saved when I was seven. I'm 51. 
That's a lot of time. I mean, you can do the math yourself. I ain't going to embarrass myself up here in front of everybody. But uh, some of us have been saved 20 and 30, 40 and 50, maybe more years. And we can forget. Some of you were saved as a child and all you've ever known is this. First of all, praise God, as Brother Charlie was saying, praise God. But sometimes there's a trap in that and that we just think this is the way it is for everybody. Oh, no, every, listen, hey, I'm going to say it in a minute, but I'm going to say it right now. Everybody's not saved. No, Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, very familiar. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And look at this, and few there be that find it. Now we get in a meeting like this and we've got this big, huge crowd. We can just start thinking, man, everybody in the world's saved. Everybody in the world's not saved. As a matter of fact, the majority's not saved. And it's unbelievable that me and you are saved is what it is. And I know, I know, I know there's a lot in here and you're second and third and fourth generation Christian and you ought to shout about it. You ought to thank God for it as we said. But I tell you what else you ought to do. You ought to go back in your history and you ought to find out where it started and you ought to find out what a big deal it was, how God reached your family when it started. And what you'll see is it's a miracle that your family got saved and that you never even had to worry about it because he did it all the way back there. And it's just as much of a miracle as it is for Brother Burton who got saved right off the bar stool when he was 30 years old. It's just as much a miracle for some of us that were saved as kids. Amen. It's a big deal. Listen, everybody in the world's not saved. You know what everybody in the world is? Everybody in the world does have heartaches. Everybody in the world does have problems. Everybody in the world has tribulation. In this life ye shall have tribulation. Everybody has it. But listen, they're going through it without Jesus. But you and I, because by the grace of God, we heard the gospel and he gave us the faith to believe the gospel. Hey, because of that, we're going through our troubles and trials with the help of the Lord. It's a privilege to be saved. You do not deserve to be saved. I do not deserve to be saved. My children do not deserve to be saved. It is a privilege. It is the grace of God that we are saved. Oh, listen, if you're sitting on a row with your family and they're all born again and on their way to heaven, don't take it for granted. Don't get used to it. Don't just assume everybody's family's like that. No, no, no. You're in a special group. You're in a privileged group tonight. Because of the grace of God, we're saved. Bless his holy name. It's a privilege. You know what privilege means? Listen, a peculiar and a particular benefit or advantage enjoyed by a person, company, or society beyond the common advantages of other citizens. A particular, peculiar benefit or advantage enjoyed by a person beyond the common advantages of other citizens. And the majority of the other citizens of our world are not saved but you are. What a blessing. Now let me just say, I'm not saying that like we're any better. We're no better. I could have just as easily been born in a Muslim country. I could have been born to a Muslim family and been raised my whole life to believe that Allah was God. I could have been taught that if I'd strap some bombs to my body and take other people's lives, that I'd have a hope of paradise. I could have been taught I'm no better, listen, than the little kids that were born the same day in this world that I was born into those kind of families. But by the grace of God and by his goodness, I wasn't born into that. I was born somewhere where I would hear the gospel and I'd be able to get saved that I live a blessed life today because of the goodness of God. It is a privilege to be a Christian. You say, but everybody in the world don't like Christians. Oh, listen, don't let that sway you. It's a privilege to be one. Amen. Brother Charlie and Brother Mike and Miss Vicky were growing up with an unsaved, unreligious daddy and a Catholic mother in New Jersey. Is that right? You know they wasn't the only family in New Jersey that was growing up like that. They were not the only kids growing up with a Catholic mama. Absolutely. Brother Charlie was even christened, I believe, or something like that when he was young. They weren't the only ones growing up like that. There was, a, there was piles of them, thousands of them, hundreds of thousands maybe. And you know what happened to them though? What happened to them was that Jesus came and mom and daddy got saved. And, and his daddy told me a while ago, the first person he ever led to the Lord was Brother Charlie. So Brother Charlie sits here saved tonight. Hey, Miss Vicky sits here saved tonight. Brother Mike sits here saved tonight. While well, listen, while well, listen, many other kids living on the same streets, raised in the same situation, 
are still not saved. You know what it is? It's a privilege. What a blessing. What a blessing to be saved. Brother Burton got saved from that lifestyle. How many other 31-year-olds were in Arkansas running the bars? And they're still not saved. They're not in a meeting tonight. They didn't stand up and give glory to God tonight. Hey, they didn't have a son get up and talk about how God spoke to his heart. Think about that, Brother Burton. Can you think about that old, that old drunk having a son that the very God of the universe would come down and speak to his heart and cared so much about Dale that he told Abdel Judah, you need to say something about unsaved pastor's kids. You say, you believe that? A hundred percent. Oh, yes. And I don't know if there were any more pastor's kids that were there that night that were lost and there didn't have to be. Our God cares enough about that one right there that he would have told that preacher exactly what he needed to say. You know why? Because God's wonderful. And he wanted to save Dale. And Dale responded and got born again. And you know what, Dale? It's a privilege that you're saved, son. Not even every pastor's kid grows up and, and is saved. But you are. It's a privilege to be saved, isn't it? I was thinking about Mrs. Tyson. Many of you know Brother William Tyson, his wife's testimony. She was in an unsaved home, an unsaved family in Maryland, and the bus workers came. Thank God for the bus workers came. You said, well, not a nice coincidence. It wasn't a coincidence at all. It was God. God was after her, and God was going to save her and give her a chance to be saved. And she got born again, and now she's got saved children that are serving God. You know what? We can get so deep in the ministry sometimes that we can forget the fact that everybody's not saved, and what a wonderful blessing it is that you are saved. And I just want us to pause before we get, we don't need any more challenge tonight. We just need to stop and say, thank you. Thank you that I'm even here. Thank you that I even know what a Bible is. We ought to bless the Lord for the privilege. I don't know your story, but you ought to just stop for a minute and take the halo off and realize that it's the grace of God. Amen. Brother Dean, in the middle of his message, I had some of these things in my notes. He started talking about holy, holy, holy. He started talking about the Lord and how holy he was. And you need to stop and realize that that holy, holy, holy king of the universe wanted, hey, wanted, sinful, sorry, unworthy sinners like us to be a part of his royal family. Amen. Have you ever thought about that? He wanted you and me. He's never had a bad thought. Listen, I, I, I've been saved a long time. I continually fight my thought life. He never even had one. And he looked out and said, but I want that one in my, I want that boy right there. If he'll come, I want him in my family and sent the Holy Ghost to deal with my heart and invite me to be a part of the royal family of the God of the universe. We need to stop and think about that every now and then. I believe we'd be like Mephibosheth in 2 Samuel 9, 8 when he was there fearing for his life thinking David was going to sentence him and judge him because of who he was. But instead David started showing grace and kindness to him. And boy, when he realized that this king was going to show him kindness, you know what he said? It said he bowed himself and said, what is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? That's the way I feel about salvation tonight. I want to say, Lord, what in the world were you thinking? A holy, wonderful, righteous God like you, knowing that I was going to get saved at seven and all of my worst things I would do after you saved me. And you still invited me, that old drunkard's boy, to be in the royal family of the universe. Hey, you're, a, you're, a, you're a child. To them gave he power to become the sons of God. What a privilege. I believe every time Mephibosheth slid his crippled legs up under the king's table, the Bible says, as one of the king's sons, I wonder if every time he thought, what a privilege. What a privilege. I get to slide up here. Everybody just thinks I'm one of the king's sons. That's the way I felt sitting in here tonight. That's right. What a privilege to be saved. Second, lastly, it's a privilege to get to serve. 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1, that song they were singing is they were giving glory for what he's done. That's what I'm doing. By the way, I didn't know they were going to sing that. 
Brother Charlie didn't really know. And when I, he called me and we were talking about something, and I said, no, I said, I'm going to preach something about this. They already had that song in the program. But that's what I'm trying to get you to do tonight. I'm just trying to get you to slow down. And, and yes, we need to deal with every challenge God put on our heart. We need to make the changes that go with the challenges that God put on our heart this week. Don't leave and, don't, and not change. If God dealt with us about prayer, then let it be different next week. Amen. But before we do all of that, can we just stop for a minute and think, how did I even get in here? How did I even get in here? What a blessing. What a miracle. What a miracle. Now, I know that it's harder. I know it's harder for some of you who have been blessed to grow up in the promised land. I get it. And I'm not saying that sarcastically. I understand. But you need to also, as I said, think back and realize maybe the, the miracle in your life's a little different, but it's nonetheless miraculous. And it's a privilege to get to serve him, not only to be saved. Verse 12, he said, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful. Look, putting me into the ministry. We didn't put ourselves in the ministry. He did. He asked us, putting me in the ministry, who was before, now notice, notice what's going through Paul's mind, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, and I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. You know what was going on with Paul right here? Paul was saying, I just can't hardly believe he lets me do this. That's what Paul was saying right there. And he was remembering who he was and where he was from and what all he had done. And as he looked back and thought about that, and then he stopped and thought, what am I get, how, do I get, how did I get on his team? How did I get allowed to start doing this? And it became such a privilege. And here's what he said. Notice that he pointed out the grace and that he said it was exceeding abundant. And that's what I say tonight. The fact that we're here is evidence of the exceeding abundant grace that has been poured in our lives. What a blessing to get to serve the Lord. I hope we all realize that he doesn't have to have us. And Brother Charlie, I don't know who you told to come. And Are they ready? You ladies, go ahead and come out and get ready for that song. We'll be finished here in just a minute. Have you ever seen, and some of you dads have got little boys, uh, Brother Mike that was up here testifying has got his little boy Michael, and I was thinking about them too earlier. If you've ever had a situation where he was doing something, I heard one one time a guy was cleaning out his uh, garage or something and he had a bunch of books and different things. Maybe his attic it was. He was cleaning it out and uh, he was carrying all these books and different things down, had to go down the stairs and out to the garage. And his little boy come along and said, Daddy, what are you doing? And, and uh, his daddy said, well, I'm cleaning all this stuff out. I'm carrying it downstairs. The little boy said, well, Daddy, I want to help you. I want to help you. He wasn't very big at all. And the dad said, well, I don't know if you can. Yeah, Daddy, let me help you. Let me help you. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, see if you can get those books and you carry them down. I'm going to take this load. And he took a load down. The little boy started stacking up some books and, and, and got ready to try to carry them. As he's getting ready to try to carry them, he wasn't strong enough. He dropped them and he tried it again and he dropped them. And pretty soon he just started crying. He just sat down and started crying. By the time daddy got back up, the little boy was just sitting there with tears on his face. And he said, son, what is the matter? He said, daddy, I just ain't strong enough. I, I just want to help you. And he said, and I can't help you. I'm just not strong enough. And Daddy said, well, let's see. And, and he started stacking them books up again. And he put some of them in that little boy's arms. And then, and then the daddy just said, and he reached under and picked up the boy and the books and all of it. And he started carrying that boy downstairs. And the boy was so excited that he was helping. Look, I'm helping. In reality, it was harder on the dad for the boy to be involved. Some of you dads can say amen right there. You've been trying to do something and your kid won't help and, and you're really like, you're not really going to help. You're gonna make, it's going to be harder for me if I let you help, right? Sometimes we just tell them that. No. I just want to be with you. Too bad. Go in there and see your mom. Thank God he's not like us, right? And what I realize is this. I think sometimes that's me in the ministry because I do want to do something for him. I do. I want to please him. He's the best thing that ever happened to me. And I want to please him. And I said, well, I want to do this. I want to do that. And I think sometimes it's, it's harder for him to get it done with my help than it would be if he just did it without me. But he is so kind. 
And he wants to be near me. Can you believe that? Can you believe he wants to be near us? Drawn out of God and he'll draw out of you. He bids us come. And because he wants to be near me and because he sees I want to serve him, he just picks me and the books and everything all up. And sometimes you get full of yourself and you start thinking, boy, look what I'm doing. And God's up there and just shaking his head saying, without me, you can do nothing. And God don't got to have me. No. The old farmers used to say this, if you start thinking you're something, shove your hand in a five-gallon bucket of water and pull it out and see how big of a hole you leave in it. Now, you city people are like, what does that mean? <laughs> it means this. You put your hand in that water, when you pull it out, there is no hole. It's like you wasn't even there. That's how important I am. Now, I understand we all got a part to play. I'm just trying to help us tonight to understand this. If I decided I ain't doing this no more, he can use something else to do it. He don't got to have me. It is a privilege. Yeah. I got some cards recently uh, in the last year or so, I think, from a couple of the boys in our church. It was a family and she got two sons and they sent me a card. I don't know if it was for Father's Day or, or no. <laughs> I ain't their daddy. It wouldn't be Father's Day. Uh, my birthday. <laughs> Sorry, babe. That was a slip. I'm not their father. <laughs> I'm already in trouble. I was so nervous about preaching tonight. I forgot today is my wife's birthday. Aww. I know. I know. I've already begged forgiveness and it's probably going to be a real expensive mistake. But... Uh, <laughs> It'll be well worth it. It'll be well worth it. I didn't even know what the date was. I was just fretting to death over preaching tonight. So now I'm in real trouble. I just told her I got other kids in the church. That's a mess. <laughs> okay, two boys that are no kid to me <laughs> gave me a card for birthday or Christmas or pastor appreciation or something. Brother Mike, I don't remember all they wrote in it, but they put the phrase, my preacher. They wrote the phrase, my preacher. And I'm going to tell you, it done something in my soul. And I, other than husband and daddy, I can't imagine any other term applied to me that have done more in my heart than them boys saying, you're our preacher. Yeah. Our, our auditorium has several exits. And, and, and so the way they built it, there's no particular exit place where you can go and stand and greet everybody. And so through the years, I just come and I sit on the stairs right beside the pulpit. Right when I'm done, I just come sit right there. And people that want to come by and talk do. And a lot of times kids will come and they'll talk to me, which I love. Suffer little children to come to me. Jesus, they came to Jesus. I don't want to be scary that the kids would be afraid to come talk to me. And they'll come. One family said that their little girl started coming and she'd say, I want to go. She was saying, I want to go see the preacher. She couldn't say it just right. She just kept saying, I want to go see the creature. I want to go see the creature. I'm her creature. And what a privilege it is. Yes. To be somebody's preacher, to be somebody's preacher's wife. It don't matter if it's five people calling you that or 5,000 calling you that. What a privilege to serve him by serving them. And it might be that you're their Sunday school teacher. Or it might be that you're their bus worker. It might be that you're this or that. You're that door greeter, whatever it is. If they saw you out in public, they say, oh, they go to our church. That's my, what a privilege. What a privilege. My creature. I got a little letter from one once. And I kept it for the longest time in, in my old office. Uh, the desk had a piece of glass on it over the whole thing. And I put it under that glass. So I'd always see it. It was about that big. And it said, all the preachers in our church preach good, even you. <laughs> I thought, well, pride needs that to stay right there. <laughs> even you. What a privilege. What a privilege. Can you believe we get to do this? 20-year-old U.S. women's Tennis star Coco Golf this week. I saw a little video where the Team USA, or not golf, tennis, excuse me. The Team USA tennis team was all standing together, had on their outfits they would wear to the probably the opening ceremony or whatever. And the captain stepped out and started talking. 
and he was making an announcement. And he announced that Coco Golf, she's 20 years old, I think she just won her first major this year, that she had been selected to be the, the female flag bearer for the entire Team USA Olympic team at the opening ceremony. I think that's tomorrow. And when they told her you could just see it on her face, she couldn't believe it. And she, he said, step out. And they had a special white coat that they put on her. And, uh, and, and she, she was, they were talking about what a big deal it was. And, and it, I read one quote that she said, I never thought in a million years that I would have the honor of carrying the American flag for Team USA in the opening ceremony. I can't even imagine. I can't imagine a kid who's worked their whole life to get to a certain level and finally to get there. And then on top of that, they get this unbelievable honor. I wonder what it felt like when they made that announcement and she received that in front of her friends and peers. I would say that's worthy to feel some honor, wouldn't you? Yeah, I love America. I love the Olympics, by the way. I hope we win every medal in every sport. Gold, silver, bronze. Here, I doesn't seem very, you know, nice. I don't care. This is, this is about the USA versus the world. Yeah, I, I, lose, I lose a little of my preferring others when it gets to the Olympics. <laughs> so I, I don't have a problem with her feeling honor over that, Brother Cam. I think it's a great honor. Out of all the athletes, think about all the athletes that'll be there that could have been chosen, and they chose her. She's 20 years old. But can I say this to you? She shouldn't feel any more that she was chosen to carry that flag. She shouldn't feel any more of a privilege than I do or than I should that this coming Sunday in a little old town in Mary, North Carolina, 7,000 in the whole city, that God will let me walk in there and carry his banner. She shouldn't feel any more privileged or honored to represent our great country than you should when you walk into that little Sunday school class and those kids are looking up at you that see you come in there every week or you go on that bus or you clean that church or whatever it is that you do in the service of our king. That girl carrying that flag should not feel any more privileged than me and you feel that the very God of heaven has decided to allow us to have a part in what he's doing in this world. Oh my. They're going to sing a song and we're going to help them sing on the chorus, Lord willing. And it simply says this, look what God has done. I stand amazed to think of his love. I don't deserve it. There's no way I could earn it. Eternity is not long enough to thank God for all he has done. What old song says this, do you remember when with all your heart you longed to serve him? But you didn't think Jesus could ever use someone like you. Some of you remember that. Some of you remember when the Lord was dealing with you about your calling and you were like, Lord, you can't mean me. You can't mean me. That song says, just look how he's used your life since he brought you out. Just remember where you were back then and thank him for where you are now. And I just want us to finish and I know there's be a few more things that'll be done. I just want us to finish praising again over all that he's done and the privilege, the privilege that we're a part. So I don't have a big part. I didn't say a big part. It's a privilege to be saved and it is a privilege to serve in any capacity. Let